Whether you call it Kvake, Kvik, or Kvike, there's no denying that this unique Norwegian yeast has had a remarkable impact on the brewing scene, and Imperial Yeast's A43 Loki is one of the best versions out there. With the ability to produce a clean beer when fermented as warm as 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, you heard that right, while also performing well at more standard ale temperatures, Imperial Yeast A43 Loki is as versatile as it gets, meaning you have zero excuses for failing to brew throughout the year. Learn more about A43 Loki at imperialyeast.com and grab a pouch for your next batch to see what all the fuss is about. As every brewer is very well aware, making a batch of beer involves a number of steps, one being the boil, which serves a few purposes. In addition to imparting beer with the necessary bitterness to balance the malt sweetness through the isomerization of alpha acids in hops, uh, the boiling process causes particulates present in the wort to clump together, some of which makes its way to the fermenter. Then once fermentation is complete, even more stuff, including yeast, falls out of solution to form a layer of gunk referred to as trube. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and for this episode, I'm joined by contributor Will Lovell to chat about the impact extended contact time with Trube has on beer. Well, not only can we sit here and try to go with Trube versus Trub as pronunciation fodder so that we can <laughs> get hate mail from both sides. Uh, so I'm going to call it Trub just to be uh, inconsistent. But um, but also, um, I think the concept of Trub in the uh, fermenter is a much more significant thing now that a lot of people are brewing in uh, kegs and unitanks and just serving it straight out of there. So this is a really exciting topic. I'm happy to dive into it today. Yeah, well, exciting enough to be the very first experiment that I ever did for brewlosophy.com. Uh, for those of you who haven't been around since the beginning, I think it was back in like May of 2014, we published our very first experiment. We hadn't quite honed our approach yet, so we're not going to dig too deep into it, but it was on the impact uh, fermenting on a lot of kettle troop, uh, you know, has on a cream ale. And here we are, you know, over 10 years later, and we've done five more experiments focused in various ways on uh, the, you know, the different aspects of Troub. And uh, we're going to focus on one today as well that we think is quite interesting. All right. If you enjoy this show, we'd love for you to consider joining the Brew Crew by becoming a patron of Brewlosophy, which you can do over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Coming up later this month, July of 2024, brewing and beer steward instructor at Dakota County Technical College in Rosemont, Minnesota, Andrew Burns will be taking questions from patrons. In addition to his vast experience in both home and professional brewing, Andrew has been a guest on the Brew Lab podcast, where he's discussed the various options for acquiring a brewing education, which all of us here at Brewlosophy agree is very important particularly for those considering going pro. Andrew's going to be hanging out with patrons on Saturday, July 27th, 2024. Uh, so make sure to make your pledge of just $3 or more by Friday the 26th. All past sessions are stored on our private Patreon and Facebook pages so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Learn more about all of the rewards we offer for your support and become a patron today over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to support us is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when shopping online. Your shopping experience doesn't change at all and we get a little kickback for the referral <coughs> feedback is brought to you by claw hammer supply who offer brewers various options for high quality reasonably priced electric brewing rigs in various voltages and sizes i've used their 120 volt system for five gallon batches as well as their 240 volt 10 gallon setup both of these units are awesome claw hammer supply really puts the effort into ensuring their systems do exactly as they're intended to do in as efficient a way as possible if you're not ready to make the jump to electric quite yet they also sell 10 and 20 gallon brew in a bag home brewing starter kits whatever it is you're looking for do yourself a favor and visit clawhammersupply.com we're confident you're going to love their stuff just as much as we do all right, Bama or Bama Brewski, uh, a.k.a. Matt and Sarah, who all assume are from Alabama based on their username, wrote in with some feedback after listening to our recent episode on ascorbic acid. They said, my wife and I have had great success with ascorbic acid in our brews. We keg and close transfer into a purged keg, and we haven't had any issues with cold side oxidation since we started using it. While we haven't done a side by side, we have noted a distinct lack of oxidation comments in our judged beers. In fact, our double decocted Munich Dunkel took best of show uh, and we used ascorbic acid in it as per the genus brewing recommendation we add one teaspoon into a five gallon batch 
uh, to the mash at the beginning. Now, Will, this is something that we've been talking a bit about in the in the our the brew crew, uh, you know, the the brewlosophy contributors recently. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on Matt and Sarah's comment on on their usage of ascorbic acid in the mash as opposed to at packaging, and how that might you know impact uh, the 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 I guess the flavor and the oxidation qualities and and stuff like that. So, um, so adding it to the mash and then adding it packaging are really just kind of working it from two different angles, right? So, so what we tested was obviously at packaging. If you read the instructions on the actual ascorbic acid itself that I bought from the homebrew shop, it says to add, you know, a teaspoon or whatever at packaging for a five gallon batch. And we do know that ascorbic acid, uh, will act as a, antioxidant and will eat up that oxygen, right? So that we know that scientifically it does that. Um, it's just in my experiment, I, I think there's probably a little bit too much O2 in the, the vessel. We didn't do a closed transfer. We, we um, added a lot of uh, air to that uh, that vessel <laughs> whenever we added in there. So um, so that's probably why we got the result that we did. Now, on the mash, it does have – there is some uh, research out there, although what's interesting is Genus Brews is probably the most cited source of this, and so I really need to dive into whatever article he has at the bottom of that YouTube video to kind of see. Yeah. Um, I just I just don't want to haven't wanted to pay for it yet. That's really why I haven't read it because uh, it's you got to subscribe to whatever uh, you know scientific foundations articles. Um, but uh, but yeah, so but that's you're trying to pre- prevent these antioxidant are these oxidative compounds from getting into your beer whenever you add it to the mash. And so this is something um, that I have on my calendar to kind of investigate and check out. And so I am curious about it. But to me. Um, Either way, I don't think adding it to the mash or at packaging is going to have a negative impact. It seems like for you guys, it's having a positive impact in whether it does everything that we believe it to do, or maybe it's just you'd have a really good closed uh, pressure transfer uh, into CO2 purge kegs that, um, you know, that we know for a fact that will help reduce oxidation in your beers. And so, um, so maybe it's the combination for you, or maybe you just got a lot of process things going for you. Um, I, I don't know, but as long as it works for you, keep doing it. Yeah. I, that, that is going, going to be the essence uh, of my comment here, but uh, I also have a couple other things I want to talk about. We, first off, we always appreciate hearing from listeners, especially when their anecdotal experiences don't align with our experiment findings. We've experienced that as well, where, uh, you know, when we're just drinking the beers, we think we taste, uh, the impact of whatever variable it is we're messing around with, but then we put it, you know, through the actual triangle test and come to find out we really can't tell taste or perceive any other differences. So that is just completely normal human stuff. We're not, I'm not just because I bring that up doesn't mean I'm trying to like dig on anybody's perception or anything like that. Now, in this case, again, I've got a couple of comments. First off, I am a fan of the genus brewing YouTube channel. I really enjoy watching that. And I definitely recommend our listeners go check it out as well. Give him some love. He's doing a lot of good work over there. I'd actually, actually seen the video that Matt and Sarah referenced a while ago, but I did rewatch it after getting this email. And as they mentioned, their recommendation, the genus brewing recommendation is to add it to the mash, not at packaging as we did in that experiment. Now I have no personal experience with ascorbic acid. I mentioned that on the episode with you, Will. So I can't speak to genus brewing's claims about, you know, how it works necessarily, even from an anecdotal, you know, perspective, but it it sounds valid enough. And I can understand why you guys would, you know, take them at his word. Uh, If your experience and good results. Like you said, Will, all the better. That's great. I just feel like I have to point out that for one, you know, someone claiming to have had a good experience is what we call anecdote. It's not evidence. And I just feel, again, I just feel compelled to, to, to qualify that as not a dig. We all experience these things. Um, it's just the way kind of science works really. And, and you know, it, it, science doesn't judge, right? We Science doesn't really care about my feelings or yours or anything like that. Also, Munich Dunkel isn't really a style known to be too sensitive to oxygen. You know, it's a lager. I get it. And I fully believe it can be oxidized. I'm just not sure, you know, if Matt and Sarah are following good uh, packaging processes in the first place, I'm just not sure that the, you know, oxidation is going to be terribly noticeable when drinking it on its own. Um, And I'm not, I'm not going to buy into this claim that, that, you know, the presence of ascorbic acid is the reason that, you know, that Munich Dunkel, that one best to show wasn't oxidized. Um, you know, we're all driven to think that, that the things we do matter. We talk about this often on this show uh, and that they make a difference. Otherwise, we wouldn't do them, you know, and so we convince ourselves that they, they make a difference. I've spent over 20 years studying this stuff. So it makes sense that somebody who uses ascorbic acid would think that it's having some meaningful impact on their beer. And again, maybe it is. In fact, I won't, you know, I, I, I kind of want to believe that, that 
it, it is it, it having more of a positive impact than it is a neutral or negative one. And so I'm I'm with Genus Brewing on that. I just I think for me, uh, on a, on a kind of a deeper level, I require solid evidence before accepting anything as as tr- like real fact. Um, so there's that. That's just kind of my blowhard way to <laughs> to respond to that. I'm not fully convinced that your beer wouldn't have taken best of show had you not used ascorbic acid. I bet it would be have done just as well. That's my own personal opinion. I do have one little minor nit to pick, and it's the same thing with Trub and Trub. Will uh, I had to learn from Matt Del Fiaco that it's not ascorbic acid as the genus brewing guy says it's a scorbic it's a hard k in there uh i thought that was interesting i grew up up until i was what almost 40 years old i was calling it a sorbic acid only to find out i'd have been saying it wrong so um anyways thank you for the feedback uh, matt and sarah we again we always appreciate hearing when others you know experiences with a variable we've tested out don't um, necessarily line up with our findings so very interesting stuff if you have show feedback or a, a correction on something we've said or anything you want to share with us you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or or drop us a note on social media. Please, if you haven't already, go check out our YouTube channel, The Brewlosophy Show. Martin has put so much time and effort into this project, and he's got some really cool stuff in store for the future that we're confident everyone listening to this podcast will love. Uh, you can find it by going to youtube.com slash at The Brewlosophy Show or simply searching YouTube for The Brewlosophy. Uh, make sure you subscribe so you're notified when new episodes drop. Alrighty, when we're back from this break, our focus will be on the impact extended contact time with Troop has on beer. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clear wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, Do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. The mighty and resilient Merrimack River, carving through the communities of our great region. My name is Linda Lorden, proud president of Merrimack County Savings Bank. And like the river that serves as our namesake, we're a constant yet ever-changing presence. Because to us, it's bigger than banking. It's about powering communities and putting people first. It's about knowing where you came from and where you're going. That's Merrimack style. Visit us at themerrimack.com. It was around the time I made the transition from extract to all grain that my participation in various online brewing forums really ramped up. And one of the commonly discussed topics was true. Whereas some swore that its presence was all bad and would lead to unpleasant off flavors, others retorted with stories of how they don't worry about separating the troube out. You know, they're just pouring it all from the kettle into the fermenter. Um, and then their beers are often scoring well in competitions and, and such. It was this that ultimately inspired my very first experiment where I compared a batch fermented with a bunch of kettle troube to one uh, with minimal amounts of troube. We've already talked about those findings on this show a long time ago, so I'm not going to belabor that. But suffice to say, I was pretty surprised with uh, both the objective and subjective results, which led to even more questions about the perceptible impact troube has on beer. Will, why don't we start this one off by discussing, you know, first off, what troube actually is in the first place? Well, what is troube? Is it I guess, in essence, it is an amalgamation of particulates from wort and beer that consists mostly of proteins and tannins as well as lipids, hot matter, and in the case of your fermenter, yeast. Um, and so this this kettle troube is performed during the boil. I'm sure you've all seen it. When you bring it all to a boil, you get that nice foamy layer on top of kind of proteinaceous stuff, and then it eventually falls out into the bottom of the kettle. And then when you cool everything down, you're supposed to get that cold break that helps further uh, push a lot of that stuff and coagulate it out to fall to the bottom. And so that, uh, 
And so this stuff that falls to the bottom of your kettle, whenever you transfer over, depending on how uh, particular you are, you're going to get some of that into your fermentation vessel. Yeah, and I think uh, you know right off the bat we should we should just uh, focus a little bit on the different types of trube. They're all it's all made of mostly the same stuff, but it's a it, you know the, the the term trube or trub as some people say it uh, is really used to kind of uh, describe the or refer to anything that falls out of solution, whether that's wort or beer. So you know a lot of our experiments uh, from the past have focused primarily on the impact of kettle trube in the fermentation vessel. Well, as soon as you pitch your yeast, now it's I guess we could call it fermenter trube. Uh, it has some of that other stuff in it as well. So I don't want to confuse people on that. Some of our experiments, we might you might hear us <laughs> mentioning kettle trube, kettle trube, uh, when, we're, when we're really just referring to the same stuff. All that protein and tannin complex, you know, the the hop matter from from the wort, uh, the, the yeast, all of that stuff is trube. And typically, what we're looking at is uh, in our in the five experiments we've done, and the one we'll be focusing on in the next segment uh, of this episode is the impact that the beers contact with that trube has on the perceptible qualities of, of the beer. Uh, and in this case, we're going to be focusing more on the, the impact of extended time on the trube in the fermenter has on that beer. So just to get that out there to clarify some things. Now, there are some general claims that I remember at least, and I'm curious what your recollection of trube talk <laughs> was like, you know, from 10, 15 years ago, whenever you got started brewing. Uh, you know, the first few batches I made, I didn't even know what the term trube meant. Uh, I, I was doing partial boil Oils and then topping that up with, uh, you know, cold water or ice, if I've, as I've mentioned before. Um, and I would just pour the whole kettle uh, of wort, very, very concentrated wort at, at the time, uh, you know, into my fermentation vessel, pitch my yeast and let it go. And I never worried about it. It was, it really wasn't until I went to the all grain uh, method of brewing that the issue of true became this focus. And I just remember hearing people constantly talk about one, particularly as, as the true that contains yeast in it, that you got to get it off that as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you're going to get autolysis off flavors, which are very unpleasant for anybody who has ever actually experienced that, uh, you know, autolysis flavor. It's awful. Um, but the the idea, and that, that's really, if you look at, think about it, that's really where the whole secondary ferment, fermenter thing came from, was let your beer ferment, but as soon as it's, you know, three or four days in and it's done, rack it out of the primary fermentation vessel into a secondary to get it off the trube because there was this concern that leaving it on there could lead to off flavors. Do you recall that in, in the beginning of your, uh, your brewing journey? So, um, my name's Will. This is my Trub talk. Um, yeah. So, so basically, uh, I, I'm with you. So, so there's lots of things, right? So the claim that it leads to hazier beer, right? Because if you dump your, but, uh, but I had the same experience when I had a, a kettle, it was like a little five gallon, you know, kettle. It didn't have any valves on it. I literally would just do my, my, you know, I guess it was a, you know, a, an extract, ba a extract batch at that time, but I do my little extract beer and then I would just dump everything into the, you know, into the, the kettle there. Like maybe I'd, I'd have a hop sock or something to keep my hops together, but I would dump everything in, uh, cause I didn't even think about it, but yeah, yeah. everybody tells you it leads to hazier beer. Uh, and so you need to get it off of there. And, and anecdotally that makes sense, right? You know, you want to, if you have less hazy stuff in your, your beer, then there should be less haze. And, and I think we've shown maybe that the opposite of that, but yeah, off flavors for sure. Like everybody, especially in the fermenter. Oh yeah. You got to get it off of there. Otherwise you're gonna get off flavors. Um, there's a, a guy in my club. Maybe Chris is listening. Uh, I'll, I'll say his name. It's fine. He can come back to me later. And he <laughs> claims that if he leaves beer in the primary fermenter for more than seven days, there is an off flavor that he specifically associates with that. Hmm. And, and I'm like, seven days sounds crazy to me. Um, but, but he's, he's, he says that that seems to be the case for him and maybe it is i i don't i know what he uses for his system and for for his uh, fermentation system but uh you know and so maybe something about his system his process does produce that but uh but yeah i just i i, I mean i've had beers in the fermenter for you know a couple of months and not sure that i noticed much in the way of negative effects but you know that's anecdotal experience for me yeah no no so the 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 hazy thing you know the, the the two biggest claims that i remember in the early days of my all grain brewing are that if you don't get it off the trube early enough or if you leave it on the trube you know too long that you are going to pick up you know yeast 
autolysis off flavor, which to me is like burnt rubber. People describe it as being meaty, <laughs> gross, uh, it, having kind of a, um, a, a plasticky flavor, uh, you know, not not the, the chloramine, you know, chlorophenol flavor, but that kind of it's just this artificial. It's really ick. It, you know, when you get it, you get it. Uh, so, of course, nobody wants that in their beer. But the other argument was, yeah, if you don't get it off that trube, you're going to have a hazier beer. What uh, really blew my mind in pretty much all of the Trube experiments that we've done so far, or the ones that I I performed at least, uh, that was the opposite of what we found. Uh, not in terms of the flavor thing. We've been kind of back and forth on those uh, based on the, the actual variable that we're testing out. But one thing that has been very consistent is that higher amounts of Trube during fermentation do seem to have some impact, not only on clarity, uh, you know, the, the, the beers fermented with, with more Trube tend to be markedly more clear than the ones fermented with less. Um, and then the other thing is that fermentation activity tends to kick off quicker. There's, there's you know, l- less lag. Uh, it's more vigorous. Uh, there, it, it, in a way where you're looking going, well, this seems like a good thing. Uh, come to find out, you know, true does is made up of uh, various compounds that, that are nutrients, to, you know, to yeast or are technically like yeast nutrient. So that part of it sort of makes sense. Uh, what's interesting to me is what about that leads to clear beer? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but it was it was just a fascinating observation over and over. We don't test for clarity, right? The, the triangle test very intentionally is aroma, flavor, and mouthfeel. We actually use opaque cups so that people don't distinguish the beers based on how they look uh, because anybody can do that. You know, that's why we take pictures, but it's fascinating. I don't, I don't know what the, again, I don't know what is contributing to uh, uh, beers fermented with higher amounts of trube or, or sitting on trube for a certain amount of time ha- being clear, but it, 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 that is some, if you're looking for clear beer you know maybe that's one uh, route you can go yeah i, I kind of thought about that a little bit you know and i'm i'm not a uh, a food scientist or a beer scientist but you just kind of wonder if that like extra proteinaceous stuff that goes in there um if it's charged in such a way that it kind of attracts more proteins to help coagulate and drop out i just just kind of thinking out loud there i'm sure somebody will email me and tell me why i'm very wrong but i i kind of thought about that a little bit I was like well maybe there's just enough extra protein or something in there that just it just helps coagulate things together a little bit more and drop out faster i have no idea um, but as far as like healthy fermentation and stuff like that i was thinking actually back to uh because i think Cade did the olive oil experiment and there are lipids in the troops so i wonder if some of those lipids help reinforce cell walls kind of similar to some of the other uh, nutrients that are in there as well so um, I think it's also very fascinating how that was. But, I mean, I think of the the experiments you did, because uh, we've done, at least for Kettle Troube, I think we've done at least four or five. And I know there was a Vienna Lager that I think you did, and then a West Coast Pills that Jordan recently did, and both those came back non-significant. But both of the German Pills uh, experiments, actually, um, the one that Phil did in COVID, another one that you did, both came back significant. So I just kind of wonder if there's just something about a, a style there or a, a hop choice or, or maybe just it's, it's the one style we've done that was uh, light enough to actually accentuate it. I'm not sure. Yeah, or I, I was thinking about that as well. So if you look at the experiment that I performed that you just referenced, now, you know, th- this is a was done in 2018, um, slightly similar to what you know, we're going to be talking about today, uh, except for uh, my thing was in the fermentation vessel. So what I did on that one, just to just to overview it really quick, because I do think it's interesting. We had done a few troop experiments that returned non-significant results, just meaning that that tasters could not reliably tell beers apart when they were fermented with higher amounts of troop compared to a batch fermented with as little troop as possible. Okay, that's great. The beers were more clear that had more troop. Uh, they fermented harder and faster and started quicker. So there some what I would call benefits uh, and people couldn't taste a difference. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, geez, let's test the extreme. And to do that, I'm going to look at a pale lager, which uh, for this one, I did a German pills. Uh, and I, you can go check out this uh, article on brewlosophy.com. I actually put a video, like a, t- like a time-lapse video of these two batches of wort settling. And one, uh, the, the no troube one has, looks like it has almost no troube at all. The other one has quite a bit. I mean, I think, I think what I did is I poured the majority of the troube from the bottom of the kettle into the ferment, uh, the fermenter to really test the extreme on this. Right. Um, and then what we did is fermented them and left them in the, their fermenters for different amounts of time for a, a more extended amount of time than I normally would, I should say. And in that one, there was a perceptible 
difference. These beers, even I could tell them apart, you know, me and my crappy palate. Um, and the Troop one, it didn't have what I would refer to as yeast autolysis flavors, but it had a flavor that I wasn't a big fan of. It was kind of, again, it was that yeasty, rubbery thing. If you've ever been silly enough like me to like dip your finger into a pack of liquid yeast and taste it, that's what it tasted like. And I don't, I don't know you know, it, it was clear. So it didn't seem to me like there was a bunch of yeast in solution. So maybe it, that the presence of all of that troube was contributing something, you know, flavor wise to the beer. And it really took going overboard on the amount of troube to get that flavor out. Um, so I don't know, it, you know, that's fascinating when you compare that finding to all of these other ones that seem to suggest that the presence of troube doesn't really have much of an impact at all. Yeah, and that may be a function of time, as you said, just because I know, um, you know, one of the arguments for for not having that much troop go over into your uh, fermentation vessel is that there are some uh, compounds, some metals and things in there that can reduce shelf life. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't imagine that like a month would be the end of the world, but um, obviously, at least at least in this one uh, and maybe maybe if you count fills two two uh, incidents, maybe, maybe it is so. Um, and, and, you know, autolysis. I have a sad story about uh, when we lived in Germany, I shipped about two cases of uh, Orval home and, uh, and that got a taller size cause it was in really hot in those shipping containers. And when it got home and again, that kind of rubbery, uh, in a little bit of astringency and rubbery. It was just such a sad thing to happen to such a beautiful beer. Uh, oh. But yeah, oh, it's Orval, man. I love that beer. Um, but yeah, but, 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 but yeah, I'm, I'm actually surprised that you, I think you, the word you use was flubber in the article, and I'm, I'm surprised <laughs> that you got a flubber uh, component to there. But, you know, if we're going to talk about uh, three men in a trub, we might as well talk about flubber, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, there, it, it's in, if you look at the take, just take the current brewlosophy contributors and what the things that they do when it comes to, you know, trube during fermentation, it ranges all the way from not caring at all, you know, to Jordan who, uh, you know, particularly when he's making lager beers, he will rack his chilled wort to a vessel, let it settle. He calls it a settling vessel or a settling tank. Yeah, uh, let a settling it, tank. Yeah. 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 And he lets it settle. And then he racks the clear wort off the top of just the trube into his fermentation vessel and then proceeds from there in doing that, one of the thing, one of the, and we are, you know, we don't really know where everything in brewing came from as much as people might think we do. Uh, w- when you look at this, like over focus almost uh, among home brewers on uh, ox, uh, ox oxygenation, not oxidation, on oxygenating their wort. Uh, one wonders, you know, if perhaps the reason that became uh, a, quote, necessity was because of the fact that people were working so hard to keep all of that nutritious trube out of the out of the fermenter. And so there was really n- not much there. And it needs that oxygen for well, we know what, you know, all the yeast need oxygen for, um, whereas the trube kind of, you know, makes up for the lack of oxygen in wort. And and in fact, like I mentioned before, it really does seem to contribute to a, a reduced lag and very vigorous fermentation. Well, if you don't have any of that there, you're going to you're going to supplement with oxygen and maybe yeast nutrient and all of that stuff, which is great. And maybe there is some impact that going that route has over uh, using a little bit of troube uh, in its place. Uh, but I, but it's funny to me because you do, you know, we've got this crew of people who all brew differently and, and, and take different approaches and have different beliefs and opinions and all of that and uh, it really does kind of span the spectrum there of, of our beliefs on on you know whether you know beer should be fermented on troop or not yeah i'm one of those i'm not really uh so concerned with keeping it all out i don't have a settling uh tank or anything but um i don't if i get a little in there i'm not too worried about it but in general uh my my little valve on my uh my delta all-in-one systems is, is kind of high up there and so generally when i get to there whatever's below the valve stays in the uh in the the fermentation or in the 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 boiling kettle and then whatever comes out comes out so um if a little bit of true happened to settle above or was still in suspension i don't lose any sleep over it but um i'm not going out of my way to dump the whole thing in there yeah that's that's where i'm at as well so i don't do the whole settling tank thing but I, I don't intentionally try to get I, I don't even really think about it uh, when I'm when I'm transferring uh, wort to the fermentation vessel um, but I'm not like over focused on keeping every little bit of trube out of my fermenter of course but I'm also not it, you know it's not in my mind to like oh rack a certain amount into the fermenter I just kind of go with whatever's still in suspension <laughs> once my wort's cool and I'm done cleaning some stuff up you know uh, it's just a part of the process and I've not you know on an, on an anecdotal level I never felt like an issue that I had 
had with my beer was because there was trube uh, during fermentation. Like that's not an, an issue that I would say has impacted me or my beer. Um, so, you know, again, autolysis. And when we use that word, all we're talking about is, is that, you know, when, when yeast die, they break down and release compounds that impart these flavors, again, of like raw meat. Some people will say it's sulfuric, so kind of farty, I guess. And I, I perceive it as burnt rubber. I heard soy in one, one article. One article said soy. I've never gotten soy from dead yeast guts, but what I mean, but who am I? Yeah, the only time I've ever gotten like a soy flavor in beer is a uh, are like porter and stout, um, and I think that there's some thing with using certain roasted grains that can kind of contribute this soy sauce like flavor. Uh, yeah, I've never gotten soy from. I've never. The thing is, is the only time I've ever brewed one single beer in my 500 plus beers of I've brewed in my day that I ever had autolysis with, and it was intentional. I was testing a theory, and sure enough, you know. I took yeast. I, I was making a Kolsch. It was the first brew in a bag I ever did, actually. Uh, and I took this old, like six month, seven month old uh, yeast slurry that I had harvested from a starter, and I just pitched it straight without propping it up or anything. And yeah, it was awful. I mean, my whole car smelled like somebody peeled out, you know, um, or my garage smelled like somebody peeled out with their car, you know, in there. And it was it was nasty. You don't want to drink that stuff. So if you can avoid it, do it. But I, I don't know if fermenting, you know, based on the experiments that we've done, uh, if fermenting on trube is is contributing to autolysis, but might it have other impacts? I mean, are you aware of other claimed downsides to fermenting on trube or even benefits uh, to having uh, to, to its presence in the work? Um, so, so the benefits are the ones that aren't so known that we just kind of discussed that nobody talks about, like, you know, um, more, more vigorous, less lag time and fermentation kind of things. Um, apparently clarity, clarity is a benefit according to the, some of the articles that we've in the results that we've had on this topic. Um, but the downside, it's usually autolysis. Um, some people say that you can leach off flavors, uh, back from the tree if you're letting it sit in your serving vessel. Um, you know, and with the rise of univessels and, and fermenting in kegs, you know, the, the reality is, is a lot more people, are probably serving on top of uh, the true than, than ever before. So that's why I think this is kind of a timely topic. Yeah, the, the whole serving from the fermentation vessel, which, again, thanks to these manufacturers out there who are making some really novel, you know, cool uh, fermenters that, can't, you know, hold pressure and you can actually serve beer from as well. Nice one and done um, But with with the increase in that, that's ultimately what inspired the experiment we're going to talk about here in a minute was was the, you know, the ability to do that. Well, can we can we get away with it? And like you, I, you know, the all of the negatives that I hear about Troob's presence uh, in the beer and or wort. I uh, d- d- hadn't seemed to really panned out in my personal experience. Um, and the benefits are, are obvious, right? Again, fermentation and clarity. But besides that, you know, it's kind of like, who, you know, le- who cares really if you're doing it or not? I went over to a friend's house. This is a few months ago. And uh, he poured me a beer off of his tap. And I'm sitting there drinking it and telling him, you yeah, know, this is great. He's like, you're never going to guess. It's been sitting on. I, I never like racked the tube, you know, racked the beer off of the tube. Uh, it's sitting in the fermenter. I just fermented in a keg and it's been there for about a month. And I would never have known. I mean, it blew my mind that this beer tasted as good as it did even after a month on the Troube. I mean, that, that that is a thing I think more and more people are doing. Now, uh, just to go over a few techniques for separating your wort from the Troube, we talked about Jordan's, you know, settling tank. I think more commonly, people just leave the wort in their kettle for, you know, 10 to 15 minutes after the boil and then make sure to rack the wort off the top of the Troube so you're not sucking a bunch up. Um, any, I, those are the only two <laughs> the only two methods that I'm aware of. Anything you can think of, Will? Yeah, that, that kind of takes us from the kettle. And then obviously from the fermenter, you just kind of leave what you can behind. So if you're using a racking cane still, you want to keep your racking cane above the yeast line. Uh, a lot of fermenters, uh, especially the unitank fermenters, are using floating dip tubes, which makes it pretty easy to, yeah. to, to rack above the yeast line. And then, you know, if you have a, a dump valve at the bottom with a little arm, then you dump off, you know, what yeast you can so that you can get the rest out of there without the tube going on. So, uh, but yeah, so I, I think, I think that's pretty much, you know, the kettle and then the, the tube that makes it over into the fermenter with all that fun yeasty stuff that, that, that adds <laughs> onto it. Um, you know, so I think those are the two main ways that you want to 
kind of rack off of it and, and get away from it. You know, mostly for what people claim to be uh, packaging and, and avoiding off flavors. Yeah. Yeah. That, you, you make a good point, though. A lot of these modern fermentation vessels, both of mine have a dump valve at the bottom as well. Now, I use the Delta Firm Tanks, and I believe you're using the same thing. And, uh, you know, our, our friend Mike at Delta told me, he's like, well, don't, don't refer to that publicly as a yeast dump valve because we don't want people clogging their thing. That's not what it's intended for. I'm like, all right, I know. But you know most people are using it for that. Uh, that's what I've used it for just for fun, you know, or to collect yeast and, and reuse later. Uh, so that's another really common way I think people are doing it. It's become so easy that if there is even a, the, the risk, you know, of, of a negative impact, then why not just remove the, the trube? You know, that's the way I'm looking at it, particularly when it's in the fermenter. So uh, now the, the experiment we're going to get to here in a bit, what did focus on a Kolsch. So just to go over the BJCP description of a Kolsch, they describe it as a subtle, brilliantly clear, pale beer with a delicate balance of malt, fruit, and hop character, moderate bitterness, and a well-attenuated but soft finish. Freshness makes a huge difference with this beer as the delicate character can fade quickly with age. To me... Kolsch is one of those. I, it's one of the reasons we have used this style in so many of our experiments. It's so delicate, and and you know there's so little to get in the way of the impact of the variable that it, you know it's a good one to choose for these. And in my opinion, if you know being uh, the, the the beer sitting on this trube for an extended amount of time is going to have an impact, you're going to taste it in a Kolsch. Yeah, I would expect the same way. And I do love Kolsch. I like those nice little subtle fruity esters. If you can somehow get that red apple character in there, it's super nice to get in there as well. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. It's such a such a nice, delicate beer. Such a It's a really tasty one to have on tap, too. If you're going to have to have 10 gallons of something on tap, uh, if you're a Brillastery contributor, Kolsch is one that you can super <laughs> crush, and it's pretty delicious. So, um, so I think it's a great one to have around. I think it's a great one to have on tap. And again, I think it's a great one to accentuate most variables uh, that we go through, and especially something like this. Because, again, this may be even a better choice than German pills for testing uh, Trube that makes it into the fermenter. Yeah, without a doubt. Now, when I made the switch to all grain and began reading about the trouble Trube can cause, you better believe I adopted methods to ensure my beer was in contact with Trube for as little time as possible, which included allowing the wort to settle before transferring to the fermenter and then getting that beer packaged as soon as fermentation was fully complete. Was my effort in vain? We designed an experiment to test it out. Results from that when we're back from this break. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. The confusion some have about Trube is understandable, and I'm not saying that because of the mispronunciation of it as Trub, uh, but rather the fact that there really are two types of Trube, as we've just talked about earlier, the stuff in the kettle and the stuff in the fermenter, which consists of some of the stuff from the kettle, as well as other particulates, including yeast and hot matter, stuff like that. A while back, after learning that some brewers were starting to serve their beer directly from the fermentation vessel, uh, uh, contributor Ryan Hansen began to wonder what impact the extended contact time with that Trube might be having on the beer so he tested it out right so to test extended trub contact time he <laughs> brewed a single ten, yeah i'm just going to contradict you uh or, or maybe <laughs> yeah no i know i know or maybe trub is just when martin does uh brewing in his bathtub it's trub at that point there I'm we go sure. <laughs> there we go yeah keep your trub out of my freaking beer yeah your extended trub time that's martin's bathtub <laughs> brew, beer uh go, go check out the philosophy show on on youtube shameless plug right here for me uh so he took a single 10 gallon batch of kolsch uh which was 91 percent pilsner malt and nine percent munich malt which is 
Uh, an interesting grist. I, I would love to, to pick Ryan's brain about where you went with the Munich malt. I probably would have done wheat, but you know, it sounds like a delicious grist nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, and then his brewing process, he mashed at 152 Fahrenheit or 67 Celsius for 60 minutes. And when the mash was complete, he removed his grains and proceeded to boil the wort for 60 minutes, in which he added 28 grams of Horizon at 60 minutes and 28 grams of Tetanang at 15 minutes. Uh, and that's for a total for a 10 gallon batch. Yeah, uh, real, real simple, real simple uh, recipe here. I've actually had Kolsch that was made with a up to ten percent Munich malt, and it, when it's pale Munich malt, it actually works really well. It just adds a malty character to it. So I'm not, I, I'm not going to speak for Ryan on his reasoning, but I've done that as well. Typically, though, when I'm making Kolsch, I'm going to put some wheat in there, uh, whatever. But regardless, I think a part of the name, the the naming of this. Uh, batch as a Kolsch was because of the fact that he used a uh, lager yeast fermented warm. Um, and so that's a way to, you know, to get away, not piss anybody off, basically. So uh, very, very simple uh, hop reg- regimen, as you pointed out. Uh, after the boil, you know, once the once the boil was totally complete, the worts were chilled and then racked to sanitize fermentation vessels. Now, uh, in doing this, uh, Ryan did not make any effort. Again, the focus here was on that, what we're going to refer to as the fermentation trube. It wasn't necessarily on kettle troop. So he didn't make any crazy effort to rack, you know, extra troop to one batch over the other. Uh, these, these words were ostensibly identical in the fermentation vessel. Um, and, and so that's the, that was the approach he took because again, we're focusing on the presence of that yeasty fermentation troop, not necessarily just the kettle troop. Uh, but after the boil, he took a refractometer reading and found that his words were a, a perfect 1046, which I think is pretty ideal. Uh, and that's when he pitched a single pouch of Imperial yeast L 17 harvest, uh, into both batches batches of wort and uh, let them ferment at 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 C for a week before taking hydrometer measurements showing that the wort or the beer at this point was at 1009. Uh, pretty ideal if you ask me. No, that, this sounds like a, a pretty pretty great process. Even if uh, the yeast choice to me doesn't quite feel like a Kolsch, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think harvest with that grist and those hops is going to make a delicious beer nonetheless, no matter what you call it. And yeah. it's going to be light and crisp and lovely. And uh, I really wish I had a glass of whatever that was, uh, Kolsch <laughs> or not. So, um, so then it, it was at this point that Ryan sanitized two identical kegs and transferred a large amount of trub, which he collected from the dump valve on his fermenter. So, so it's not the it's not the uh, yeast valve; it's the trub valve, I guess. Yeah, uh, let's call it that. Yeah. The trub the trub valve, not, not the troop valve, the trub valve, and then to one of them before equally splitting beer between the kegs. So, so he basically had two kegs. He took m- most, if not all, the trub from the fermentation and dumped it into one of them. So that's that's a pretty bold move, according to most people. <laughs> yeah, and and a little correction on uh, uh, my report of how he uh, did these beers. It was a single ten gallon batch that he fermented all together. So these beers were identical. He wasn't splitting the wort yet. Uh, I get so caught up in the old kettle troop experiments that it's hard for me to break away from that. He fermented this whole batch together, and then at the end, when fermentation was complete, just to reiterate, he took he he used the dump valve, the the troop dump valve, uh, collected all of the troop, put that into one of his king chubby. Uh, uh, I guess it's. A, a serving like a PET serving keg type of deal made by Keg King, a really neat uh, new piece of gear that has a floating dip tube and all of that. Put all of that troop into one of the King Chubbies and then uh, split the beer equally between those. So one is on all of this troop and the other one is is basically how you would you know package a normal beer without all the troop. Uh, and then he uh, you know attached those to gas, put them in his walk in cooler, which we've talked about on this show, uh, and let them sit for four weeks before they were ready. Uh, he was ready to serve them the tasters for evaluation. So again, let's just talk about this for a minute. You've got, I, what are your thoughts on this? Because I, when he was designing this and we're talking about it, I'm sitting there going, this, I, I'm convinced that this is not going to be turn out well. You know, you are intentionally taking all of that gunky troop from the bottom of the fermentation vessel, uh, putting it into a keg and then racking beer on top of that, letting it sit for a month. So not only is it there, it's there for four whole weeks versus this one over here that has no troop or, you know, as little as possible as you might expect from a normal batch. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I'm in my head. I'm thinking, boy, that Truby one's probably going to taste like the flubber that I got when I did the kettle troop experiment over time. Um, I, I, I don't know. Crazy. So, so I, you know, there's two, so my initial reaction, I share your reaction, but then when I take a step back and think about it just a little bit, you know, he is keeping the, these vessels cold, right? So that, that, you know, maybe if he'd stored them, 
you know, what happens if you store them really warm for a week or two and then do this? I don't know. But but right now he is storing them cold. So maybe the, the cooling point will slow things down enough where you, we won't get quite to that flubber aspect. I, I don't know. But but either way, it's kind of an exciting thing to test, you know, especially if you don't mind ruining five gallons of Kolsch. <laughs> Welcome to Brewlosophy, right? We ruin beer so you don't have to. That's exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, I had my my presumptions as to where this this was going to go. Uh, now, I one of the things that I was convinced of just based on, you know, prior experiences with Trube experiments is that the one that was sitting on the Trube cake was going to be clearer. Uh, you know, again, fermentation wasn't really a factor because that's we weren't looking at the just the kettle Trube thing. But I but I was convinced that the one, you know, that the presence of that Trube, whatever it does, you know, during fermentation, it's probably going to do in the package as well. Um, that just wasn't the case, though. If you look at these beers, I've got them up on my screen right now. You know, they're pale yellow, slightly hazy. With One of them has a little bit more foam than the other, though. I'm convinced that's probably just the order in which they were poured and not really a function of the, the Trube presence. They look identical to me, which is interesting because this is one of the first Trube-related experiments that did not have this, you know, notable impact on clarity. Uh, they, they both are kind of hazy. Right. And and I mean, again, if you take a step back and think about it just a little bit, you know, obviously before the tree was in the um, fermentation vessel from the get go. So dumping all the kettle tree into one versus hardly any of the other. And so I'm sure some of those things that, again, maybe there's some protonaceous stuff in there that's helping things coagulate and drop out during the fermentation process, which is going to be kicking some of that. The yeast is going to be kicking some of that stuff back up over and over again, whereas this one, it's all relatively cold. I think most of that tube is probably going to nicely fall down to the bottom of your um, keg at this point and just kind of hopefully sit there undisturbed for a while. Now, what happens if you disturb it somewhere in the process? I, I don't know, but that's not what we tested here. Yeah, you know, I was thinking back uh, to, to when, again, right around the time I made the switch from extract to all grain. And, uh, you know, in doing that is when you, or at least when I started to encounter the conflict over whether one should rack to a secondary or not. And in my mind, at least, that is a function of the presence of troop and getting it off of that troop as quickly as possible. One of the things that that advocates for keeping it in primary only were saying, and these these are big names, Jamil Zanishev, John Palmer, you know, um, on the podcast and such that we were listening to 15 years ago, one of the things they would comment on was that the presence of that troop allows for the reuptake of, you know, any uh, fermentation byproducts that you may not want to be in the beer, whether that's diacetyl or DMS, you know, the common off flavors that people like to talk about uh, that the the presence of that troop again is going to actually uh, help reduce the amounts of those undesirable byproducts uh, for whatever reason you know I'm sure there's some microbiological explanation for that and so again in my mind I'm thinking well maybe maybe serving on that that layer of troop is it could be a good thing too maybe it's not just going to impart these negative you know yeasty flavors that I don't like maybe it's actually going to help to reuptake and create a cleaner beer so th- these again these are the things that are kind of twirling around in my mind here's what's interesting again I-, I say this every time we do an experiment episode but when when the brewer is done and before they go out to collect the data we do a series of our own personal we call them semi-blind triangle tests where somebody will serve us five or six you know uh, uh, again semi-blind we don't know what's in what what beers and what cups but we, we obviously know the variable and we, and we try to perform it ourselves. Well, out of the five personal triangle tests that Ryan did, he only guessed right twice uh, and admitted they were random guesses. He said that the beers were perceptibly identical uh, to his palate on his nose and his mouth feel that, that they just did not taste any different. And knowing that he knew everything about these beers, you know, that's to me, that's really interesting. He didn't even pick up a difference when he was as biased as he was. Yeah. Um, and how often do we go sit down to do these triangle tests ourselves and we have it in our head that these things are different and, and we sit down and totally just whiff so hard. Uh, and so I, you know, again, this, this is pretty impressive. Again, he knew everything I've, I've never drank with Ryan. Maybe I know you have so maybe, maybe his palate isn't up to snuff. I don't know. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure he has a pretty good palate, but, um, you know, <laughs> it, it, the whole shitty palate excuse, you know, yeah, exactly. uh, but, 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 you know, I, I believe to him that it's probably really hard to tell these two beers apart, especially after four weeks in the, the keg with all that uh, yeast and nastiness in the one side. But I, I would have thought he would have found something different. But obviously, these beers were very difficult to tell apart that he couldn't reliably do it. Well, I, a little secret. Uh, and and we're, we're going to get to the blind participant results here in a second. But before that, 
I actually had the opportunity to sample these beers and knowing again completely what the variable was and everything. So I'm not in the participant pool, but I did it even further down the line. So I think the beers were like six to eight weeks old at the time that I tried the triangle test. And I could not tell them apart. I mean, so they'd even they they'd been on the troop for even longer than when Ryan did it or the participants did it, which was four weeks. For me, it was it was a couple weeks longer than that, and still the, the beers looked and tasted exactly the same to me. And and again, I was biased by my experience with a past troop experiment where they were different. The beers were different. So again, you know, I think you can kind of see where the the blind data is headed. But let's get into that now. Uh, Ryan served these beers, uh, the triangle test, to twenty six participants. Participants who had no idea what the variable was uh, out of that 26, 14 would have had to identify the unique sample in order for us to say with some level of confidence that, yeah, something about uh, these beers is different. And, you know, we're going to point at the variable that we are testing and, and, and accuse that of being the reason they're different. Well, in this case, we weren't able to do that because only seven of the participants identified the unique sample, which we can say statistically, at least that that's no better than just random guessing these people people couldn't really taste a difference between these beers or at least distinguish the odd beer out in the triangle test. Uh, and and again, that's a beer that was sitting for a month on a huge yeast cake, uh, a true blair versus one that was nice and clean. The thing that we are all recommended and really you know put a lot of effort into doing when it comes to packaging beer didn't seem to matter. And I think that is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think that's a, a pretty fascinating result as well. But as somebody that has uh, used keg menters in the past and that, uh, you know, advocates for fermentation kegs for some folks that are looking for easy ways to, to ferment and something that's not that expensive. Like, again, maybe this opens you up to some possibilities that if, if I've got a, a fermentation keg, as long as I keep it sitting still, I can totally pressurize and serve out of that thing without having, you know, too much of a drawback because that's, you know, again, on a Kolsch with this many participants it's not a small pool for us 26 is pretty good pool for our for philosophy i mean we require 20 so this is going above and beyond and even then still only seven can tell the difference i mean it makes me feel a little bit more confident if i'm going to serve out of that fermentation keg or, or serve out of one of my keg menters yeah, I think it's awesome. And you know, you look at you look at the uh, some of the newer gear that's coming out lately. Clawhammer Supply is now selling a larger, uh, cor- you know, corny keg that's bigger than five gallons, in part so that you can use it for v- both fermentation and serving from. You've got unitanks offered by all the various uh, manufacturers out there. All of these, re- the King Chubbies. The thing you got to be careful about with some of these vessels, of course, is their pressure rating. You don't want to do like fifty psi burst carbonation in a in a plastic, you know, fermenter, that's not very safe, but, or, or even, you know, a stainless one that doesn't have the pressure rating for that. But if you're fermenting in corny kegs, if let's say you're doing like four gallon batches, which why not, if you can get away with just racking it to a keg, fermenting it, letting it settle out all in the same vessel, and then attaching that to your, to your kegerator. I mean, that is pretty sweet. If you ask me, and again, we're not saying that this this single finding on its own is proof that you can get away with doing this and not have any problems. But it does add to the the you know I guess growing evidence in in, its, in more than just an anecdotal way that it it may not be as disastrous as some people seem to think it might be. Well, and you want to talk about uh, preventing cold side oxidation. Like if you don't transfer it to another vessel, we already know that your keg is purged of CO2, right? Yeah. Fermentation, you know, purged all the oxygen. Because fermentation already pushed all the oxygen. Yeast has already eaten up all the oxygen. You know, there's nothing but CO2 left in that headspace. And it's been pushing CO2 out of there for the last week. So you know that that, that vessel is, uh, you know, free of oxygen. And so you want to talk about reducing your chances of oxidation. Keeping it in that vessel is a, you know, a pretty good way to do that. Because that's, yeah. again, one of the problems of secondary. We're transferring it to another vessel. We have another chance for infection and oxidation. Well, here, you, it's just there. And so as long as, you know, we keep seeing these kind of results where there's no negative impact impact from keeping it on on this this yeast cake for that long then sure why not let's i think it's a great strategy yeah and and you know just to be fair we're not advocating that that there's going to be a positive impact by by you know serving beer from the tr- on the troop cake. We're just saying that it doesn't seem to have a negative one or at least a noticeably negative one at this point, um, it, it, as it relates to a Kolsch in this specific experiment. Of course, uh, I, I would be interested to see the same experiment on say a hazy IPA. You know, is that beer going to be taste fresher longer because of the fact that it is has never had access to oxygen once the yeast was pitched? Who knows? Maybe it would. Maybe the yeast 
yeast would have some negative impact on the flavor quality of, of a different style of beer. Uh, that's for future experimentation. But I do think it's very interesting that in, in this case, with such a simple, delicately flavored beer, people couldn't tell them apart despite being served on such a thick layer of troop. Fascinating stuff. Now, we do have some reader comments I want to get to. Uh, the first one comes from Josh Bull. He says, uh, nice experiment, but I'm unclear as to why you fermented with a lager yeast at 20 degrees Celsius. That's 68 uh, Fahrenheit. This temperature is out also outside the range given by the manufacturer. My response to that is, do you know who we are, dude? That's what we do, man. <laughs> we, we, we ferment with lager yeast warm. I've, I've used L17 Harvest at uh, a pretty similar temperature range around, you know, just right around 66, 68 F, you know, right around that 20 C mark. And I've had very excellent results and made some very delicious crushable beers. So I'm not surprised he had good results making a beer at that temperature. So again, I I'm, I'm kind of with you, Marshall. I think he just called it a coach to give him an out on using a warm for yeah. <laughs> lager yeast. But, but honestly, um, I've made some really good, like crushable, like Hellas and stuff like that with L 17 harvest, you know, fermenting right around that same temperature range. So I'm not surprised at all. Yeah, I don't want to go too far down this this rabbit hole, but just just to respond more seriously to you, Josh, um, we there so so L seventeen harvest. We've done a bunch of fermentation temperature experiments with lager yeast. Um, a good portion of them seem to be robust enough to not you know uh, produce these ester bombs that people seem to claim that they will. L seventeen harvest doesn't produce an ester bomb when fermented warm, uh, and, but it does seem to at least based on our experimentation produce a noticeably different flavor profile than compared. Uh, to the same wort beer, you know, fermented cool. Uh, is it worse or or better? That that's up to each individual taster to determine for themselves. I will say that I've had beers, you know, very simple Hellas and 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 Pilsner beers fermented with L seventeen harvest at both cool and warm temperatures. And I, there's something I get from the warm fermentation of, of L17. This is the Augustiner strain. I believe it is available from other labs as well. Uh, that just tastes beery to me. And I don't know what that is. Do I like it more or less? Uh, I don't know. I like it. I, I will absolutely ferment with L17 harvest at 66 degrees Fahrenheit or 19C because I do enjoy what it does to beer. And, and there is this tendency, I know, for people to justify or rationalize their you know decisions uh, and, and kind of convince themselves that what they're doing tastes better than what others are doing. I'm pretty sure that's not the case with me. I, I'm, I've got the ability to ferment cold. I've got the ability to ferment warm. It doesn't take much uh, effort for me to do either one. I genuinely do uh, appreciate what L17 harvest tastes like uh, when fermented warm. So that's just a, a little bit more of an explanation for you, Josh. Next comment comes from Bruce G. Uh, Bruce says, when I look at the method, I would uh, argue that both beers were on true, but one just had more. Therefore, I'm not surprised that no difference was detected. To avoid this issue, a power filtration and forced carbonation is needed. I bottle my beers and they always have sediment. Mini true, Bruce says. Some I keep for many months with no off flavors. Yeah, um, so I, I did kind of think about, you know, when you bottle condition a, uh, a beer, there is just kind of like a little bit of particulate that's, that falls to the bottom, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Just a mini tube is kind of a nice, nice way to say that, I guess. Uh, and so, you know, but the difference is, is most of that stuff is your yeast kind of doing that secondary fermentation falling out. It's, and it's a pretty minimal amount. It's just that really thin layer. And if you're, if you're Sierra Nevada, that really thin layer never even comes out of the bottle, no matter how much you abuse it. Um, <laughs> for the rest of us, we're not quite that fortunate. I don't know what Sierra Nevada does, but they're excellent at it. Yeah. And so um, I do think that... Uh, Yes, there's going to be some stuff that settles out, but I would say his one with where no trub was, you know, specifically transferred over, um, obviously had a much more normal amount of trub into that keg versus the one where he just like straight up dumped the trub valve into there, you know, again, two very different things. So I, I get what he's saying, um, but, but I, to me, I would have expected to have an, all that trub in there with all the extra stuff and not just, you know, proteins and solids falling out of suspension of your beer like normal uh, i would have expected that to have some kind of impact and so um so i see what he's saying um because again bottle conditioning lots of little little bit of sediment in the bottom but uh but to me they're not quite the same thing uh and also you know we have a lot more data on bottle conditioning because people have been doing that for a really long time 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I totally get what Bruce is saying, that you're not going to be able, it's going to be very difficult without power filtration, uh, you know, to ensure that the, the wort that you're transferring over the beer that you're transferring to a, uh, for a, a, a serving vessel has zero trube whatsoever. And over time, those particulates are eventually going to, you know, slowly fall out. And so maybe that is, is what equalized the flavor of these beers. I really don't know. Uh, but I get where you're coming from, Bruce. And, and, and again, more fodder for the future of uh, experimentation. Maybe one day we'll have a power filtration system to, to, to more effectively test out uh, the impact of, of the presence of Trube on beer. Final comment comes from Eric Webster. He says, uh, I'm one of those who serve directly from the fermenting keg. The six gallon kegs are perfect for a 5.25 gallon batch. That's about 20 liters uh, and can immediately be cold crashed on gas when fermentation is complete. And if you add a spunding valve to the mix, it starts the crash partially carbonated. Floating dip tubes complete the setup. No transfers is better than any transfer and there's one less keg to clean and sanitize i've never detected off flavors but i love the experiment uh, but love the experiment to get some independent verification thanks for doing this see i love reading stuff like this again you see all these uh keg miners universe univessels the chubbies everybody's got their little brand of you know fermentation keg or, or uni univessel unitank kind of thing and so to me uh i, I love getting this kind of feedback because again i think six gallon kegs are kind of awesome little fermentation vessels so you can get the full five gallon batch but even if, like you said earlier if we if you just said a, a five regular regular five gallon corny keg and did you know four gallon batches either way it seems super convenient just to throw some gas on there um put your put your liquid line on and just just crash and surf man it seems like it's a, a pretty no-brainer win-win combination yeah, you know, there's over the last, I don't know, two decades, but really more so in the last decade, it seems, there's been a lot of uh, uh, the, seem, the, the seeming, uh, you know, desire to simplify the brewing process, which if you ask me, you know, if we're going to talk about the, the state of homebrewing today, the more simple you can make it, the more likely you're going to attract, uh, you know, more people, new people to doing this hobby. So, you know, there's going to be hard asses out there who are saying, no, you can't do that. You're going to ruin your beer. Well, then just don't do it in your brewing. But if somebody else is getting away with it, like Eric is here, then more power to you. I think it's awesome. I, I look forward to trying more beers that are served this way uh, just because I'm curious, you know, how, how it works out. It's not it doesn't fit with my process necessarily because I'm not fermenting in a serving vessel. I'm for still fermenting in a fermenter. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I do think it's fascinating. And this is just another point of data that we can use to, uh, like like Eric said, verify that it does seem to work and that you're not necessarily guaranteed a ruined batch of beer. So, well, that does bring us to the end of this episode. Any last words on the impact extent, extended contact time with Trube has on beer, Will? Nope. Uh, I think we've pretty much said what we had to say. Yeah, I agree with that. Don't forget to check out our newest podcast, The Brew Lab, where host Kate Job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss the fascinating research they're doing on our favorite beverage. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through.